Our second speaker holds a PhD in linguistics. He is a president of the Language Creation Society and a knowledge translator and scientific writer making inflammatory bowel disease research accessible to the public. <laughs> Amazing. Please welcome Dr. Joseph W. Windsor. So I can only assume that uh, they put me up after Burson because they hate me. <laughs> I also promise that the uh, Language Creation Society has absolutely nothing to do with research on inflammatory bowel disease. <laughs> um, okay. So life is short, so tell those around you that you love them. But life is always also scary, so when you do, scream it at them in German. <laughs> of course, that's if you don't speak Klingon, yelling Kamushaku or I unhate you at your partner every morning would be terrifying. <laughs> Klingon is a real language, and when we write Klingon, there's a tendency to add English punctuation. So Bunny One here says, Oi, Shahutwich or my butt hurts. And Bunny 2 responds with, Nukjak, what did you say? And perhaps the second Bunny's response deserves an interrobang, but does it make sense in a Klingon sentence? Writing systems like Sumerian here are relatively new inventions dating back about 5,000 years. By contrast, one of the key differences between Homo erectus and Homo sapien was the lowering of the larynx so oral speech could become possible suggesting that we evolved natural language some 40 to 60,000 years ago. Now, writing systems are a little frozen, and as an example, how would you pronounce this word? Okay, I heard one person say it right. It's obviously fish. <laughs> you take the GH from rough, the O from women, and the TI from nation, and you get fish. Many scholars believe that writing systems evolved from a need to have an accounting system who paid their taxes, how many bushels of grain did they send this year, and keep track of that. Punctuation, relatively new again, is a bridge to convey some emotion or mood inflection in a written language that isn't possible with other characters on a page. In spoken language, English for example, we have an acoustic cue that someone is asking a question. It's the rising pitch, or this blue line in my spectrogram, that's at the end of my sentence, what did you do? And there are other acoustic cues like loudness, measured by the yellow line, or acoustic intensity, measured by how dark the spectrogram gets, that provide other cues, like stress, for example. Stress in English allows us to distinguish record from record. A stress syllable might get longer, have changes in quality, or loudness, or intensity, so we can compare the curd, that's 30 milliseconds uh, on your left, to the chord, that's 51 milliseconds on your right. So acoustically, what does the interrobang represent? If we look at these spectrograms, we can see the telltale rising question intonation at the end of both utterances, which is denoted by my rising pitch or that little blue line. When I change the sentences to emphatic questions with the interrobang, we'll notice a few changes. With interrobang, my you did what gets more range of pitch, and I'm also stressing the what, as you can see by how long and intense that word became. In the second question, what did you do? What gets stressed and elevates the pitch of the entire utterance. So basically that's what the punctuation in, or interrobang codifies in English. Let's contrast that with Klingon. <laughs> Klingon does technically have a soft stop, like a comma, that upward triangle, and a hard stop, like a period, the downward triangle, in its writing system. So we might punctuate <laughs> Me and y'all, we speak Klingon, like this. But could Klingon use an interrobang instead of a catch-all hard stop? Nuknech is how Klingons say hello, and it literally means, what do you want? Now, maybe if you're getting the 15th drunken phone call from an ex in one night, what do you want turns into, what do you want? Klingon is an unnatural language from a human perspective. It has an odd linguistic profile in a lot of ways, just one of which is how choppy the language is. On the left, you can see an English spectrogram, and you see how it all kind of flows together. But on the right is the Klingon translation, and it's very choppy, very broken up. But despite being as unnatural or as alien as possible, Klingon does have a grammar and rules for applying stress. 
Together with my co-author, uh, Cove, the Klingon translator from Star Trek Discovery, we ran an experiment on the spontaneous speech of seven Klingon speakers to see if stress could actually be acquired by learners of this unnatural language. Stress is pretty predictable in Klingon. It goes on the rightmost syllable of the root, no matter how many suffixes you add, and you can add a lot. So, jinmo, a project, or jinmo kome kokvek, those so-called minor projects. Good so far? <laughs> Okay, perfect. Let me introduce you to glottal stop. Glottal stop is the sound you might associate with a hyphen in uh-oh, and it messes with our nice stress rule in Klingon because it steals stress. So rather than mole getting stressed because from ends with a glottal stop, we stress it instead. So jinmo home kokvet bo. And the rules for verbs are different again. <laughs> Now, learning language is a tricky process if you're not a toddler, and it gets more difficult as we age. But languages do help the acquisition process by facilitating learning biases. But because Klingon is unnatural, it lacks a lot of these biases. But the rules are regular and well attested in the input, so it is theoretically learnable. So we tested our seven speakers and found that stress accuracy was just over 76%. Plus, it turns out that over a third of the so-called errors were the speakers emphasizing a different syllable, such as ku, exclamation, or a, ah, question. Perfectly acceptable, so we couldn't call them errors, and their accuracy was actually almost 84%. Most of the other errors had to do with proper nouns, so we can blame Star Trek's original series for making up names before the language was invented, and transfer effects when you oppose the structure of your first language on similar words in your second. So words like Canada, Norer, or the stringed instrument, Ashpal. In English, there's no way to distinguish any of these sentences from one another without punctuation. In Klingon, though, the suffix ko turns you made that into you made that, or a turns it into you made that, and if we add both of them together, you made that? So, back to our original question. Does Klingon need an interrobang? In English, punctuation resolves inherent ambiguity in our writing system that just doesn't exist in Klingon. If you recall, Klingons say hello by shouting, Nuknach! or what do you want? Even without a ku or a, it kind of sounds like there's an inherent interrobang there. Thank you. <laughs>